So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, two other things. One is graphene, just because Mark Graph is sponsoring. So I just need to do some uh, advertisement here. And uh, the second one, I'm going to talk about nonlinear optics using ultra-fast spectroscopy. So I promise you that in 20 more minutes, you guys are out of here. So uh, this project about looking into the ultra-fast dynamics in graphene monolayer started because of one of my grad students. He worked with Professor Hugo, who is not here anymore. Uh, and the, in close collaboration with the people in, in MacGraph that suppose you guys are going to be visiting on Saturday. Is that true? So yeah, I suppose it's a pretty good place. I've never been there. But uh, so they were able to uh, provide us very nice and uh, beautiful graphene monolayers. And it was more than that, actually. It was not a monolayer. It was multiple monolayer. And listen, I'm not saying bilayer, trilayer, or I'm saying monolayer. So they are able to put several monolayers on top of each other in a, in a sense that they're not going to talk to each other. This layer does not talk to this layer. So I have multiple monolayer. And uh, that's very good for us that we do spectroscopy because that increases our signal-to-noise signal ratio a lot. And we can actually draw some conclusions out of it. And the idea of studying graphene is because we want to understand exactly what the electron is doing out there. Again, that's all we do, right? We, we try to understand what the electron does when it's excited. <coughs> so basically, we start with the graphene. We know that graphene follows this linear dependence on the k-space. So if you think about it at room temperature, you're going to have a little bit of electrons up here, a little bit of holes down there, just because you have room temperature. And then you come with uh, the laser pulse. You can excite a bunch of electrons up there. All right? And you create a bunch of holes down here. All right? First thing that we expect to happen is that they're going to thermalize and form what we call a hot, uh, hot thermodurac ferma distribution. All right? And eventually, this guy is going to recombine slowly and then come back to what we would uh, actually have in the beginning. So we want to see that. That's what we want. Want to see? All right. Does it really happen? Let's try. So to do that, actually, we start by doing a pump and probe at 800 nanometer or 1.55 eV. That's the first thing. We, this is transient absorption again, and see the total scan is two picosec. So we want to really look to ultra fast things, and we excite this, and we start seeing this very interesting thing: a fast relaxation. And appears there's like a slow one keep showing up right here. And even the fast relaxation seems to be like changing slightly with the, the density of carriers that's like, that are excited. OK? And uh, listen, this is in a single wavelength. I'm pumping and, and probing in the same wavelength. And we see that the dynamics change. Remember when I talked about the quantum dots? That I increase the pump, it gets faster because of Auger. Look at this. We increase the pump, it gets slower. So it's a different thing. All right? And then, more than that, if we go ahead now and do the spectroscopy that I always talk to you about, we see something very cool, actually. Uh, what we see here is that if I have a very low carry, uh, density of carrier, OK, you see that when I excite it at 800 or 1.88 electron volt and probe at the same wavelength, I see a very fast decay. This is about like one or 200 femtoseconds. And then I, I move from 1.55, I go to 1.3. You see, fast and then it's low. And then go to 1.03, it's low and it's lower. And then I go up to 0 0.78, it's low. 0 0.59, it's low. Start again, it's lower and it's lower and it's lower. And more than that, and, but you see here that even if you have good eyes, you can see that the peak is reached right here. And then the peak start to move a little bit as I go to lower uh, energy. But then I crank up the power. I make it higher density of carriers. And look, this guy again gets slower a little bit. This also, this also, this also, and bang. You see 
high energy, low energy. It's pretty cool, I think. And more than that, look at this. This is 800, 1.3, you see, pretty sharp. Look at this. I can do a zoom here so you look better. You see? Pretty sharp, started getting broader, broader, broader. Look at this thing. Look, after like 500 femtoseconds, it's still flat up there. So basically, what we see here is simply this. Oh, by the way, if you look at this guy, it's flat, all right? Come down here, 500 femtoseconds. Go up, 500 femtoseconds. We kill the fast component here, you see? That's basically where the fast component goes. You see that? Let's start going slow. So basically, what we're seeing here, we believe at least, is that we create the exciton up there. Like just of like a bunch of electrons we put up there. First thing, exactly like we said, it does this. All right? And that's the fast part that we see. And then it starts to come down. Oh. Yeah, does this. And now you go down. There we go. And then you go down, and then it starts losing energy. But then it starts to the ones that are left, they start to concentrate down here. So basically, what we're seeing is, let's go back. First, let's look at the high energy one. You go down, you get like that fat curve. And then it starts to move to lower energy. It starts to move to the lower energy. It starts to populate these levels and the depopulate these levels. Again, all right? But then when you crank up the power so much, you have so many electrons there that every time the low energy electron loses one, the low energy state loses one electron, there's always going to have another one to come and populate. So that's why you have a plateau there. Eventually, that's going to finish. All right, no more electrons for you. And then things go. OK, so you, we basically doing ultra fast spectroscopy at all those colors, like I showed you for the case of quantum dots. <coughs> Even for the graphene, now we can actually see the electron cloud doing those movement. And, and finally, actually, decaying. All right? Unfortunately, we cannot go to, zero, to less than that. It would be pretty cool to go to like 0 0.4, because that would be where it would be below the, the phonon energy. So we could not recombine anymore. So we would expect this to be pretty flat. It would be very, very slow. But unfortunately, we, our laser doesn't get there yet. So, uh, and also more, uh, here we see the saturation gets much faster as, uh, in terms of this of carriers as you go to lower photon energy, which makes sense, right? If you look at this nice little thing here, less energy means you have less states. So you're going to saturate faster. So, and that's what we see here. So that makes also sense. Uh, all right, all right, all right. So I don't want to keep you guys busy for too much longer. So I just want to shift the gears here once more. I talked to you about uh, all the ultra fast spectroscopy in quantum dots, and then I talked to you about uh, ultra fast spectroscopy in graphene. Now I just want to talk to you a little bit. I promise it's going to be like 10, 15 minutes more about the nonlinear optics. Uh, because of ultra-fast spectroscopy. If you guys remember, yesterday, I create lightning using my laser, remember? And that is only possible because the intensity is so high that I can put many photons together in a pulse, hitting the sample, interacting with the sample at the same time, okay? And uh, you guys probably are sick of it already, but you guys have had learned a lot about nonlinear optics, probably probably from Paulo and Sid, so you guys know a lot more than I do by now. But uh, basically, nonlinear optics uh, reminds me the story of the kid sitting in a swing and the dad pushing. If the, the dad goes like weekly, the kid is gonna go like in the same frequency as the dad pushes, right? Now, you take that dad that's not very nice and boom, the kid's gonna go like, and it's gonna come back, right? So it goes away from this nice parabolic potential, all right? And that's basically what happened in the material. If you come with low power, 
the, the photon comes excited, the electron, the electron is going to go in the swing. It's the frequency that you have the excitation. Now you come with a shit ton of, of light on it. All right, try that. You're going to see what's going to happen. The electrons are going to go crazy. And then it's going to have light coming out in other wavelengths. OK? You're going to have interaction in other wavelengths. And uh, that's what we can do with our laser pretty easily, because we do have a lot of power, a lot of photons coming together in the same pulse. And uh, I think Sid has shown to you these guys already many times. And I want you to focus on this guy over here. This is the kite tree, OK? And the kite tree is pretty cool, because I can have nonlinear optics happening in the same frequency of the, the excitation. Because uh, chi 2, you have chi 2, you're going to have some frequency generation. So you have omega 1 plus omega 2. So your nonlinear ops is going to happen in what? Omega 1 plus omega 2, or 2 omega 1, or 2 omega 2, or omega 1 minus omega 2, and so on and so forth. But you're never going to have any nonlinear ops in, in omega 1 or omega 2. But chi 3, you can have. Can you, you can have omega 1 plus omega 1. Uh, Sorry, omega 1 minus omega 1 plus omega 2. So you're going to have nonlinear optics in omega 2. Or if you think about omega, you're going to have omega plus omega minus omega. Or you, you can have also omega plus omega plus omega, which would be 3 omega. But you can have omega minus omega plus omega. You're going to have omega. So you're going to have nonlinear optics happening in that frequency. So that's the one we are interested in. And the process that I want to talk to you about, I don't know. If you guys, I, I remember Sid telling you guys that for application that he's studying, he want a material with large refractive index, nonlinear refractive index, and small nonlinear absorption. So I tell Sid, if you're taking a material that has large two photon absorption, send it to me because that's what I want. So it's exactly that story, it depends on what you want. Uh, and basically, the two photon absorption. Well, someone might get confused because two photon absorption, all right, it's a chi 2. No, it's not, it's a chi 3. Okay? Two photon absorption is a chi 3 process. And it's actually it's the imaginary part of that chi 3 that happens at omega because it has omega minus omega plus omega. Okay? That's basically that. And if you think about in physics, that's basically what happened. We keep saying two photon absorption is pretty cool because involves a virtual state, all right? So you take, you want to go from this state to that state. So you go from this state to this. No, it's, that's dashed. It means that does not exist, all right? And from this up there, all right? So you need two photons to go from here up there. This photon by itself doesn't do anything, all right? And uh, this guy here, this virtual level actually I like to think about it as actual a level, not a virtual level. It's actual a real level. It's only detuned in energy. And again, if you think about Heisberg uncertain uh, principle, if you have a large uncertainty in energy, what happens if you're uncertain in time? It's tiny. It's zero, quite, almost. You know, it's like pretty tiny. It means that if I'm not resonant, the time the, the time I'd stay here. It's zero. It's like nothing. It means that for this electron to stay here and then get kicked up up there, I need this photon to hit the sample at the same time as this one. So it's instantaneous. All right? And then I need two photons. And then I can think about the absorption being written in this nice little form right here. Alpha naught, which is the linear absorption, plus alpha 2 times i, which is the intensity. So the, so the more intensity I have, the more effective absorption I have. But if I'm in this regime right here, for this electrons, uh, for these photons, I'm sorry, I don't have linear absorption. OK? I don't have anywhere to go here by linear absorption. So oops, oops, oh, there we go. That's what I want. That guy goes to 0. So that's always left. And by the way, she is the person who first predicted this would happen. And uh, because of that, we call the unit for the absorption. So all right, let's go back. 
If I look at my cuvette, this is my cuvette. You see? It looks beautiful and brilliant. But then, if I look inside, I have a bunch of molecules or a bunch of quantum dots or a bunch of nanoparticles in general. All right? And if I want to talk about two Fosnum absorption, I, I have this alpha 2, which is the absorption coefficient, which depends on how many molecules I have, all right? If I take, let's say, a very low concentration, it doesn't absorb that much. If I put like a lot of molecules, it's going to absorb a lot. So this depends on how many molecules I have or how many dots I have. So we typically use delta, which means cross-section, which is basically that alpha 2 times the photon energy divided by the number of molecules or the number of dots. And uh, just because she came up with this idea, we call the unit Gopper-Meyer. All right? I think it's fair enough. So she proposed this, if I'm not mistaken, 1930? 30. 30, right? 1930. And uh, I think it was only in the 80s or late 70s that someone actually, after we have like good lasers, that people could start seeing this. It was 70s or 60s? You remember when the first two photon absorption was observed? I think maybe late 60s. I might be wrong. Yeah, 64. 64? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So it was 64. So it took like 34 years for someone to actually see it. But you see, some, there are smart people out there. Uh, and uh, the cool thing is this. If the absorption is proportional to I, it means that if I take linear absorption, like linear, if I absorb one photon and I come with, a, uh, with the, the laser or the light, uh, here's a laser right here. This is a molecule that absorbs one photon. You see, emits to the whole thing. Why it absorbs, it emits. But now, if the absorption is written as a function of I, when I focus down, I think Sid has talked to you about Z-scan. Have you? So in the focus, you have way more intensity. When you have a lot more intensity, it means the absorption is going to be much bigger. And then you're going to have fluorescence right at the focus only. And then someone could think about using this as a as a process for doing, for example, imaging in three dimensions. Because this I cannot do three dimensional, right? Because I don't have penetration then. So I don't have the, pen the, the penetration resolution. But with this, I can have penetration resolution. So I can think about this as a good way to do that. And uh, with the ultra, ultra fast lasers, we can reach this limit of high intensity much easier. So with much less energy per pulse. So with ultra-fast lasers, I can have high intensity without worrying about burning stuff because I don't have, I don't have too, many, too much energy, all right? And uh, one way to measure this two-photon absorption is basically doing this. We come with the laser. The laser excites the OPA that I talked to yesterday. It comes, hits the sample. We collect the PL, to, throw to a monochromator. You detect it, and here, to, here is the PL. All right? And we change the laser power. We keep increasing the laser power. And we see, remember, photoluminescence is proportional to how much light is absorbed, or proportional to the absorption times C. Sorry. OK? Proportional to the laser power. However, my alpha now is alpha not I. So the photoluminescence should be proportional to the laser power squared. OK? And if I take this, for example, for different powers, and I plot, that's our goal. Power squared, linear dependence. So I know that this is two-photon absorption. I know that my emission I'm seeing because of two-photon absorption. So uh, we can access this very easily. Because with ultra-fast lasers, we can go to have very well-functioning OPAs. And we can access this regime of two-photon absorption at relatively low uh, energy. You see, 0 0.6 milliwatts, I'm talking about 600 nanojoule. OK? That's very low. Uh, and I want to show you a case that we're, we're studying uh, recently. This is not published yet, but it's pretty cool. Is that we decided to study two photon transitions in copper indium sulfide photon dots. And uh, this is for. Main, many reasons, but some of them is that 
you can tune the band gap all around this range. But I'm lying here a little bit because to go from to this range, you have to change the sulfur for, to selenite. Okay, you have to change the sulfur to selenium here, but you can go there. This guy is not toxic. Remember, it has no cadmium. I told you cadmium is not that bad, but this one does not have cadmium. Now I'm gonna say cadmium is bad. <laughs> Depends on what I wanna sell, right? Uh, and it has this huge stoke shift. Look, we're talking about 400 MeV. That's huge, all right? Uh, and because of large stoke shift, low toxicity, and the fact that I can tune it everywhere I want, it makes it pretty good for applications, especially for photovoltaics and, again, for bio-labeling. Because if I tell you inject cadmium sulfide on you, probably you don't want. But if I tell you inject this, you'll say, oh, all right. Should not be that, that bad, okay? So the idea here would be to use this for imaging of biological tissues. And then we go ahead and measure two photon absorption for this guy using this technique over here. So we change the, the excitation and collect how much em emission we have. And just by simply uh, correlating the amount of uh, light that is in, uh, it's collected, we can actually calculate what's the two photon absorption cross section. And uh, if someone has uh, curiosity to know how we do that, come talk to me after because if I go to the whole thing here, we're not gonna finish before two. So, but basically, we can tune in the wavelengths and do the whole thing here. And uh, if you see, we can go actually from, this is a tiny quantum dot. The emission is at uh, two, uh, here's the transition, here's the photon energy, okay? So two electron volt. This one is a little bit smaller, is a little bit larger quantum dot, so emission is at small, uh, sh uh, lower energy, so 1.9, and this one, 1 1.8, okay? So we're making quantum dots bigger and bigger. One thing that we learn is that the two photon absorption increases, goes from about 3,000 Goper Meyer to about 10,000 to about 15,000. So we can increase the two-phone absorption by increasing the size. And that's not too surprising because we talk about cross-section, right? So as I make it bigger, it has more cross-section. Which is easier, you to hit a ping-pong ball or a basketball? This, of course, the basketball just because it's bigger. So the idea is basically the same. If you come off, there's a photon coming, the chance for it to interact to a larger ball is much bigger than to a small one. So the idea is that. That's not too surprising. But here, I think the two things that I want to call your attention is this. First of all, look where it absorbs. This is the photo energy, 1.3 electron volt, like 1.4, 1.3. And look where it emits, about 2 AV, 1.8 AV, okay? So my question to you is, if I want to do something to image something inside of you to discover if you have a disease, like a cancer, for example. It would be much better if I could do that without having to cut you down, right? Cut you and go, all right, oh, there is a cancer there, or not. Like, it would be much better if you just can scan you and tell you right away. But to that, I would need to do what? I would need to be able to make light go inside of you, probe, and light coming out of you to tell me if you do or not. But are we transparent? Huh. We are. You guys know that we are transparent in the red? Does anyone know? I can prove to you. I'd like to do this. So let's use my cell phone. That's cool. What color you see here? What color you see here? What does it mean? I'm transparent in red. So it's pretty cool, isn't it? If, some, if you're walking by someone and someone says, oh, you don't see me, you think I'm transparent, you say, I'm sorry, you are wearing, you are wearing red. <laughs> yes, we are transparent in the red. I, I mean, at least much more transparent than who we are in other colors. So we can tune this guy nicely in a way that we can actually match the first transparency window for the body. 
with the photoluminescence and match exactly the second transparent window with the two, with the two photon absorption spectrum. So in principle, I can take this guy, inject on you, and use it if I, if I can talk to my, my friends in the biology department, and if they can put some sort of protein on your, on, on attached to this in the way that it's going to attach only cancer cells, for example. I can inject on you and scan you. And uh, if you work out the math, you go down to like seven centimeters right, right now. Not that much, but oh, seven centimeters is this much. You can, eh, you can get something, all right? So it's pretty cool. You can actually image, get real-time image without having to cut you down. All they have to do is inject you with nanoparticles and don't, don't have cadmium. And so this is a possible application for this. And uh, we can learn this by doing two photospectroscopy. And there is another thing cool about this is that we can learn new physics. I promise you new physics. Let's get some new physics. Look at this. I was telling you that one of the good things about this material is that it has a huge stoke shift, right? Look at this. It absorbs right here and emits right here. Look at the huge stoke shift. And then you go to any nanomaterial conference, people keep asking you, why the heck there is this huge stoke shift? And we got the answer. Look at the two photo spectra. There's a peak here, there's a bump here. There's a peak here, there's a bump here. There's a peak here, there's a bump here. Look at this bump. It's before this bump. This bump is before this bump. This bump is before that bump. You see? So basically, if I only look at this guy, what's, gonna ha what's happening? Well, for some of you that know quantum mechanics, you know that if one state, let's think about state that has parity. If one state is allowed by one photon transition, it's forbidden for two photon transition, and vice versa. Typically, in materials, what you have, you have the first excited state right here. And this is allowed by one photon. And the, sec the first allowed transition for two photons is up here. OK? That's what happens typically in materials. So you would have this peak up there. This would be that guy. What we found out by this experiment is actually what's going on is that, so here is where you should emit light. But what's going on here is actually there is an inversion. The first allowed transition for one photon is actually above the first allowed transition for two photons. OK? And actually, this light over here is coming from this state, not from this state. So it's coming from here. So what's going on in this material is actually pretty cool, because you, ab you absorb here. So you absorb here. And before emitting, it comes down here. And what happened? That state, if it does not absorb, can it emit? Well, it can, but it doesn't like to. So when you go ahead and measure the linear, you, you go ahead and measure the fluorescence for this fellow, it has like almost one microsecond lifetime. It's almost like a triplet state. It's so freaking slow because the oscillator strain for this transition is pretty much zero. All right? And uh, so with this experiment, we can explain this. So well, actually, what we can see here is we see an inversion of the allowed and forbidden transition. So now, the first excited state is a forbidden transition, which is just allowed by two photons. So this is a pretty cool enigma that we just have solved. So uh, hopefully, you guys are going to see a publication coming out in the next uh, month or so. And uh, so I just want to close this with this thing. And I think uh, I almost uh, have another five minutes, but I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Uh, I mean, I can't answer question, but uh, the idea is that we can use nonlinear optics or ultrafast spectroscopy and put this together with very fancy novel materials, graphene, quantum dots, core shell, nanorods, all kind of uh, fancy stuff, okay? We can learn new physics. We can block electrons, block holes. We can see inversion of symmetry. We can see all this kind of things. We can come up with new explanations. 
But on the other hand, we can also come up with new applications. So we can increase uh, uh, LEDs performance by an order of magnitude. We can think about novel methods for solar cell to work. We can go and apply, for example, in, for bioimaging and so on and so forth. So actually, I, I'm glad that I could talk to you a little bit about ultrafast spectroscopy because I have been doing that for about 10 years and I really enjoy it. It's pretty cool, it's pretty fast. So thank you guys. Okay, so I think we have time for one or two questions. And as you know, Lazar is also hosting a experimental oh, yeah. uh, course. It's on Tuesday, be right? Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay? So for those that want to see fast experiment, go there. Yeah, Lazar, please, uh, can you go back to the slide that you just explained about this uh, two-fold absorption peak and the Stokes uh, uh -huh. thing? I don't think I quite understood exactly what's going on there. This? Uh, yeah, this one. Uh -huh. uh, you said that you have like a two-fold absorption that uh, peaks on about 1.35-ish EV there. So no, no, but actually I'm talking about this guy. Okay, this one is the two-fold absorption yeah. that you have You here. see the, 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 this? Ten, 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 ten. So basically, uh, typically in a material, okay, what's typical, what everybody knows is that uh, you have the linear absorption right here. So this is the transition. You have such energy. The two photon absorption, the first allowed transition, is higher energy. So it would be this guy. So for this specific material, due to the way uh, it uh, aligns, turns out that it inverts. And the first transition is actually down here. It's this guy over here. And we see that for all, all samples. Of course, they end up to be much weaker because you have to remember that uh, the magnitude of this has to do with the detuning, okay? That's the detuning. But now if I invert the thing, oh, sorry. If I invert this, look at the size of the detuning. It's quite huge and goes what? One over the detuning squared. So if you increase the detuning this much, this guy is gonna be weaker. But the transition, the oscillator strength for the transition itself is not weak. So this is the first allowed transition. Anyone else? Okay. If not, so if there's no more question, let's thank Lazaro again.